said, I'd like to introduce today's um, speaker, who is Sadie Honey from Civic Actions, um, and she is an agile guru with Civic Actions, who are a non-profit focused web development agency, who I think are based worldwide. Um, but yeah, I'll pass it over to you, Sadie, and uh, okay. thanks for coming along today. I'm just um, passing over to you, Alex. All right. Um, Give me a what should I be seeing? <laughs> there you go. I'm not able to share. So, David, if you pass the ball to Sadie, drag it down in the, the participant mm -hmm. list, then Sadie, you'll see something that comes up and looks like the, the WebEx dashboard. Um, okay. And then how do I... You don't have control yet. So David, can you oh, okay, pass okay, the... Okay. So nothing, yeah. nothing yet on your side, Sadie. Um, David, if you click on participants, um, <coughs> You can drag. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. And now, Sadie, you should see a button that says "Share My Desktop." Yep. Great. Okay, and then you are probably want to see. All right. Am I on? Are people able to see my slides? Yes, I see. You. That's good. Great. Okay, great. So my name is Sadie Honey, and um, as David said, I work for a company called Civic Actions. We do software development for nonprofit education and government clients. And our mission while we do that is to teach people how to act like, teach those organizations how to act like modern startups, meaning um, building software that's user-centric, um, iterative, um, gets regular feedback from users, and uses open source tools like Drupal. Uh, so I'm going to talk today, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to Agile and Scrum. Very brief. An hour <laughs> um, is just touching the surface of it. Uh, usually, you know, there are a lot of, lots of books, lots of blogs, lots of classes that you can take to um, get a more in-depth view of it. Um, and the first, and I don't, I, I sort of intended, and David, tell me if I can do this or not, sort of um, to poll the participants in terms of if anyone has experience on an Agile software development team. Yeah, I haven't used the poll feature too much, but maybe Oh, okay. So, so Sadie, we or can have people speak up. raise yeah. hands. We can have them. Sure. Okay. At the bottom of, you know, in that same participant panel, guys, there's a, a little hand in the lower left. Um, and that'll give us a count. Okay, I'm a little worried that I, well, can someone tell me <laughs> how many people? Have, <laughs> I, I seem to be showing you my Skype window, and I don't want to be doing that. Um, the other thing would be, if you want this to be more of a conversation, Sadie, everybody can unmute themselves and unmute. And so if people just wanted to chime in with Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. Yeah. Anyone, does the silence mean that no one has any experience with this? Yeah, yeah. I've got some experience with that, Joe. Okay. One person? Yeah, I do too. Um, yep, I do Kanban okay. and Scrum. So, oh, great. Okay, so a few. <clears throat> uh, so this, we're just going to talk about why someone would use Agile and a little bit of history. Um, we're going to talk about the Agile Manifesto and then give you just a basic overview of Scrum, discuss some other Agile practices that you might encounter, and then um, open it up for questions and discussions. 
And by the end of this discussion, our goal here is to, for you to have a brief understanding of the benefits of Agile, an overview of Scrum, and then understand where to go to deepen your learning if you're interested in doing that. So why Agile? Um, okay. Sorry, I'm, there we go. Um, so why would people do Agile? Um, and a little bit of history. So um, what we think of as modern management rises in the earliest, early um, 20th century with factories. Um, sort of that's where you start to see the hierarchies of people who are thinking, telling people who are not thinking what to do. Um, usually that's in a factory where there's a series of repetitive tasks. The problem with applying that to software is that software is not a series of repetitive tasks. Um, another way that software has been thought of is that it's like we're building a bridge. And if you're building a bridge, you need to plan everything out ahead of time because you don't want to send a car across that bridge um, without having a really good understanding of whether it's going to fall down or not. But we're not building. When, we're, when we are uh, creating software, we're not building a bridge and we're not doing a series of repetitive tasks. What we're doing is solving problems together. And while one person can come up with a perfectly fine solution to a problem, you get a better solution if you have a group of di people with diverse viewpoints solving that problem together, and an even better solution if you have a diverse group of people who are getting regular feedback from the stakeholders in having that problem solved. And that takes us to the Agile Manifesto. Um, as early as the 1950s, you start to see iterative software development. Um, but for some reason, we then go into a period of uh, 30 years where um, we think that the way to run a software uh, project is to plan it all ahead of time. Um, then in the 90s, you start to see different frameworks. Um, Scrum emerges then. and um, extreme programming, which is something you may have heard of. There are a few other um, <clears throat> frameworks that emerge that are um, about iteration and collaboration. Um, so in the early, I think it's in 2000, I don't remember the year, 2002, I think, practitioners of these frameworks get together and write the Agile Manifesto. So this is the Agile Manifesto. They get together and they um, I just heard a presentation last week where they said that they drafted this in about an hour and then argued for a long time after that. <laughs> um, but the Agile Manifesto says, we are uncovering better ways of creating software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. And that is, while there's value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So there's a criticism of Agile that says, oh, you don't do any planning. Oh, you don't do any documentation. And that's not true. You do just enough of all of these things. You know, so it's important to, to note, there is value on the items on the right but the items on the left are more valuable. Um, one of the benefits of work, and actually back to the, um, the Agile, this is the Agile Manifesto. It is backed up by 12 principles. Um, and if you Google Agile Manifesto, you can find a site where the, it sort of goes into more depth of the 12 principles behind this manifesto. Um, one of the benefits of working in this way is that because we're not building a bridge, you can get value to your users or your sta the stakeholders in your project very quickly. So now let's talk about Scrum. Um, so Scrum is a, uh, it's a framework. It is a type of agile development. It's basically a set of practices that um, if you follow them, you sort of uncover things about the way your team is working that you get you to the sort of aha of Agile. Um, and a lot of people talk about um, that the concept is simple, but actually doing it is hard. Scrum is based on these five values. Um, 
if you if your team is working with these values, you're really um, you're fine no matter what practices you're doing. And again, it's the practices of Scrum that get you to these values. Um, so I'm just going to say a little bit about each of these values. Commitment is um, sort of the team commits to doing the work at hand. Focus is about focusing on the most important thing and not being distracted by other things. Openness is an openness to um, input from each other. Respect is uh, respecting each other so that you can collaborate together. And courage is about saying, courage is like saying things like they are to sort of point out when there are problems and admit them and address them. Um, so a scrum team is made up of three different roles. There's the product owner, the scrum master, and then the scrum team. Um, you want a team that is uh, the ideal size, they say, is um, uh, five plus or minus two, and it's um, this. This is the team that owns the work. You want it to be multidisciplinary and um, sort of focused on one project at a time. The product owner is serves as the voice of the stakeholder. They're the ones that understand what work needs to be done. And actually, I should say something about. Um, about back back about the team, it is a self-organizing team. That means the team decides together how the work should be done. It's not a self-directed um, team, meaning the team needs to be solving the most important problems for the organization that it's working for. And that is the role of the product owner. The product owner is the voice of the stakeholder. They are the person who prioritizes the work, knows um, what the organization and the stakeholders need and po basically points the team in the right direction. Um, they prioritize the work by the highest value that it brings to the organization and they work directly with the team. The work that, is, um, that the team is addressing is listed in something called the product backlog. So basically this is a list of work items. Again, um, I mentioned it's prioritized by value to the organization. And um, the product backlog is constantly being reprioritized. Um, one of the jobs of the product owner is to understand the landscape that the organization is in and what changes are happening. Um, things rise or fall in importance based on the landscape that the organization is in. And so the product backlog is constantly being reprioritized. Um, so you've got your team, you've got your um, list of things to work on. So the team then sort of takes, uh, takes some items off the top of the product backlog and focuses on completing that work in a two to four week sprint. Um, at the end of that sprint, what you're shooting for is a potentially shippable increment of the product. Um, that means it's working software. Um, you know, remembering back to the Angel Manifesto, working software is uh, basically the focus here. At the beginning of that sprint, you have a sprint planning meeting where the, the product owner and the team decide together what will we deliver in this, say it's two weeks, so that our sprints tend to be two weeks, so what will we deliver in this two weeks and how will we deliver it? So at the end of that meeting, the team and the product owner have a really clear idea of what they're going to deliver and how it's going to be delivered. And then the team collaborates to do the work. Um, the decision at the end of the sprint planning meeting, sort of the list of work, is frozen at that time. And the, um, you don't sort of shift things in and out of that sprint. You just decide, this is what we're going to work on, and focus on that exclusively. Um, the goal as the team is doing the work is for them to collaborate together um, and be able to ask the product owner or even end users directly questions to help them get their job done. Um, while the work is happening, there ha there's a daily check-in. The daily check-in is um, limited to 15 minutes. 
Um, sometimes it's called a daily stand-up, the idea being don't sit down and get comfortable. We're just focusing on checking in here. Um, and the, each member of the team answers three questions. They say, this is what I completed, or what did you complete yesterday? What do you plan to complete today? And what is standing in your way? And um, the goal of the daily check-in is to um, create some healthy peer pressure where you're standing up in front of your teammates and, and committing to, I'm going to complete this today. Um, and it sort of, uh, it allows everyone on the team to see progress. It allows uh, everyone on the team to see, oh, you know, Bob is stuck on something because he's come back three days in a row saying, <clears throat> that he was going to get something done and he get, didn't get it done. So it allows anyone on the team to reach out to Bob and say, hey, I've noticed you're, um, you seem to be stuck on this. Is there some way that I can help? Um, that third question, the um, this is what's standing in my, my, in my way, also allows the team to sort of get those things out of each other's way. Um, while the team is doing the work, the, the scrum master or agile coach basically helps ensure that the team is working well together. Listens for those, this is what is standing in my way, and works to get them out of the way. Um, that person might teach, facilitate, or coach, and um, you know, basically observes the team and um, sort of calls attention to problems that they may be experiencing in, in order to sort of get them fixed. At the end of the sprint, the potentially shippable piece of software is um, reviewed or demonstrated to the stakeholders. And this, um, this is uh, a demonstration that is held as widely as possible. It's, it would be good, it's often good to have users there so that they can actually interact with the software and the team can observe that and integrate you know, any feedback they get or any observations they make into their future sprints. Also at the end of the sprint, the team gets together and talks about how, how their work went. Um, and, and this is usually just the team. The, the goal here is to have a safe space so that the team can honestly evaluate how things went. Um, a common um, format for this meeting is to talk about this is what went well during the sprint, this is what didn't go as well during the sprint, you can dig into that. And then this is what we would like to try differently next time. And then you do it all again. The, um, you, you ship your potential, or you, um, you know, deliver your potentially shippable product. You go back to that product backlog that I talked about at the beginning. Take the currently most, um, uh, the high, highest prioritized items off the top of that list and uh, repeat the whole process again. Um, and that is Scrum basic, okay? If you are doing those practices, you're doing Scrum. Um, there are, are other practices that are attributed, that are often, that you often see alongside Scrum that aren't sort of Scrum basic, but I'll, I'll share some of those too. Uh, limiting work in progress. Often when a team has done a few sprints, they'll notice that they'll have items that they said, we're going to complete this item uh, during our sprint, but they won't get it all the way done. And you'll end up with this sort of half uh, done thing. Um, and so the, the, the advice there is, first of all, your item may have been too big. Like it may have been something that you couldn't really complete in the two weeks in which case the item needs to be um, uh, sort of shaved down to something that can be completed in a shorter period of time. The other concept is the idea of limiting your work in progress. If, if you as a person are working on, you know, five different things, at, you as a developer are working on five different things at once, you're not going to get done with those five things as quickly as you would if you worked on one till it was done, two till it was done, three till it was done. The metaphor here is the freeway. Like if, if you think of the freeway as work throughput and a car as, your, as a piece of work, if you have one car on the freeway, it gets through faster than if you have hundreds of cars on the freeway. 
Um, user stories is another commonly used tool. Um, normally the, or not normally, but often, the items in the product backlog are written in this format. As to, I want what, so that why. So example, for example, as, um, as a scientist, I want to log in so that I can see my data. Um, and the idea behind a user story is it keeps, um, it, keeps you, it keeps you in tune with who you're building it for, what you're building, and why they want it. And it's going to help you decide sort of how complex or how simple you can um, create something. So um, for example, if the user story was, um, as, um, as an employee, I want to log in to see my paycheck, it's going to be a more complex thing so that I can log in and just see my paycheck and not my coworkers' paycheck. Whereas um, you know, there are cases where a more simple, like log in, everybody can see everything would suffice. Um, the work is often visualized on what's called a sprint board. So this is an example of a sprint that we did for the city of San Fran um, for a project for the city of San Francisco. And you can see over on the left, we've got um, all of the work items that need to happen during the sprint. Um, when somebody grabs something and starts to work on it, it gets pulled into in progress. Um, and just as a, as an agile coach, I'm observing that the JR person has three things in progress. So they are not um, they're not doing a very good job of limiting their work in progress. What I would rather see is each person has one item in progress. Um, then when it's done, it's moved to QA staging, means it's ready to put and then ready for QA. And then once it's past QA, it's moved to done. And this is a good vis you know a visual demonstration of the work in progress and where it is and how, how they're doing. Um, another thing that you see often with Scrum is something called the burn down chart. Um, this is another, this is a visual representation of the work. So the yellow line, so um, if you think about, if, so if we go back here, and unfortunately, this sprint board is not showing it. But so, if you think about each um, item in the backlog, would have an estimate that is, um, you know, how how big, how much work is this? Sometimes it's an hour estimates. Sometimes it can be just in a small, medium, large um, kind of estimate. But anyway, at the beginning of the sprint, you have an idea of how much work you're going to get done during that sprint. So the yellow line on this burn down chart would show if we steadily completed the work all throughout the sprint. The green line is showing the amount of work that was actually completed. So as a ticket would move from in progress, well, as a ticket would move to done, we would say that that work was done. And then you get this green line. And this is actually a pretty good sprint. They did a good job of staying below, the, um, or you know, staying pretty steady with that uh, yellow line. Often, though, you'll see that it sort of squiggles up and down, um, you know, depending on how well the team is working. So that, that's sort of the brief overview of Scrum. Um, there are a lot, like I said, there are lots of classes, lots of um, uh, books, local meetups. Um, Scrum.org and ScrumAlliance.org are both places to find books, articles, primers, um, and then local meetups. Pretty all over the country, you're going to find people who are doing agile and just going and meeting to them, meeting with them, and talking about what they're doing. I have found to be very, very useful. And so now it's, um, I'd like to open it up for questions. Thanks, Eddie. That was really illuminating. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll kick it off with one question. Um, mm -hmm. Do you 
are your sprints always the same length or do you make them shorter or longer depending on the type of project? Um, so you'll, that is something that you'll, um, I think the sort of commonly held thinking right now is that a two-week sprint is a good, is a good place to start. Um, if you get longer than four weeks, you're probably not, um, you, you probably should shorten it. Um, four, four weeks is probably the longest you should do. And um, we do two-week sprints, and that, that seems to be sort of the commonly held, like, shoot for that period of sprint. Um, and the thing about sprints is it gives you these little deadlines that really create an urgency in the team. Um, and if you keep a regular sprint um, uh, cadence, you learn about your team and what and how much work you're able to accomplish in that time period. Um, and you know, and you learn things like, um, oh, we did, a, you know, whether you're good or bad at um, estimating the size of different product backlog or backlog items. So I think the key is to keep it the same length for a while <laughs> because then you're going to learn that. Um, but then that is the kind of thing to, um, to discuss in a retrospective and decide together as a team to change the length of the sprint if it's not working for you. Right. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds cool. Um, I guess the link question would be if it's a more like um, – maintenance type project where yeah. you might get something urgent yeah. cropping up for a, yeah. you know, that needs to be handled, then you wouldn't want to wait two weeks to... Um, right. Yeah. I guess. Um, there, yeah. Um, there, are a lot, uh, there are a lot of conversations about Scrum in DevOps, you know, where there is that sort of like urgent things that come up. Um, and some people, so um, there's something called Scrum Bond, so C R U S C R U M B A N, which is a combination between Scrum and Kanban. Someone mentioned that they have experience with Kanban. Um, Kanban, you can think of Kanban as like Scrum without the um, sprint time period. So instead of um, saying, instead of saying, okay, we're going to work on these five things for the next two weeks. You just pull the top priority thing anytime. You know, like you pull the top priority thing, you work it till it's done, and you go back and pull the top priority thing and work it till it's done. Um, the Scrum Bon, there's some good articles that talk about transitioning from Scrum to Kanban, um, and it is to address exactly what you're talking about, where you have a high priority fix that comes in. Um, something else that we've done as teams is we will say, okay, we're going to have a sprint and we think we can get, you know, this much done in the sprint and we will scale back and we'll say, okay, instead of doing five items, we're going to do four because we know that there's going to be two high priority fixes that's going to come through while we're, while we're working on this sprint. So that's another way that you can do it. Okay, great, thanks. I hadn't heard of uh, Scrum Band, so I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, yeah the people who wrote the articles, the people who wrote the articles, I think, are Kanban advocates and sort of see it as a um, you transition from the <clears throat> to the better way <laughs> of, of Kanban. Yeah, I guess it's uh, just different tools for different situations, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, does anyone else have any questions? Let me ask, where does wireframing fit into all this? <laughs> That's a very good question. So, um, we just had a, um, um, a colleague and I just spoke at Mile High um, agile about exactly this. How do you fit UX in general into this? Because I think um, in the past, the sort of user interface has been very waterfally, very upfront, and then you build it all. Um, so there's a book called um, Lean UX 
that talks about how to integrate UX into um, a Scrum team. The idea, um, I think the biggest idea is there is upfront work, um, but just enough work to get the team started. Um, and then the UX person is sort of integrated into the team during each sprint. So for an example, um, so say you have five items and one of them you know has a really complex uh, user workflow, then that sprint board here, and I'll go back, that sprint board would have um, the prioritized backlog and maybe there would be a column for UX instead of just saying progress. You could have a column for UX. So the, the, the difficult thing would go into the UX column and the UX person would be working on that. There's probably other stuff that's not as difficult and maybe doesn't need wireframing, especially if you're using Drupal. There's you know, sort of some out-of-the-box stuff. So developers would be working on that out-of-the-box stuff. Um, and then when the UX is done, it would go into in development. So say I'd, basically, I'd be splitting this in progress column to in UX, in development, right? Um, and then you could just like take it to QA and done. Another idea that we're playing with is, um, so for the difficult ones, they, they go through the UX stage before they go to development. And then for all of the tickets, we would have, instead of just QA column, we'd split that one into two and so that it would be um, UX review and QA review. So, so that basically all the items when they're done with development <coughs> would go through a review of the UX person to sort of make sure that um, even the out-of-the-box stuff works well. And then if it doesn't pass that, it would go back to development um, with some feedback so that the um, so that, that the issue could be fixed and then you know back to the UX person through QA and then done. Does that help? I mean, really it's this is a conversation that is happening everywhere right now. How do you fit um, UX kind of things into a Scrum team? And it isn't, people are experimenting with different things. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, I have another question, which is, how much prior research, um, user story, user problem work do you do before you just begin the first sprint? Um, so you could just begin without, you could say that your first sprint is about user research and user things. You know, um, an item in the backlog does not have to be um, uh, like develop, developing software, so it doesn't have to be programming. It could, you could have, some people do like a sprint zero, where the items in the backlog are things around user research, um, you know, identifying personas, talking to users. Um, again, I think the balance is you don't want to go crazy and plan out the whole system but you want to plan the highest priority items so that you can start kicking out software so that you can be taking software back to your users instead of um, you know, questions or mock-ups or whatever. And again, this is another thing that people are just playing with exactly how, how to do that. And, um, you know, and I'll refer you again to the Lean, um, Lean UX book talks about, um, they talk about things like um, uh, that you should be building, so, so um, as you think about your functionality of your site, that there's sort of a backbone that is the must-have pieces, and then there's sort of legs coming off that backbone that are the um, like-to-have, you know, would be nice kinds of things. So sort of prioritizing that. And so you are working through the backbone 
working software of the backbone portion of things, and then prioritizing as necessary the other pieces that would be nice to have. Is that get at what your question was? I think, um, I guess a follow-up would might. So, do you reckon that any initial scoping that's needed would happen in the backlog um, before it moves to in progress or before it's accepted mm -hmm. into the sprint? Um, right. Yes, there is, and you know, I I didn't talk about this, but there is the concept of backlog grooming. So. Um, you do need to have the item at a at a. Um, well, it kind of depends on who your team is, right? But um, if your team is mostly developers, and that, and you know, maybe there's maybe the product owner needs to be talking to users. Um, you do have to have sort of a certain um, uh, amount of information before it can be kicked to the team. Um, many teams have a what they call a definition of ready. So. Um, an item needs to have, you know, they decide as a team, before you give this work to us, you need to have, you know, these three things. And especially in an organization where there's a lot of, like, um, governance concerns or, um, um, you know, regulatory stuff, there may be sort of regulatory things that need to be answered before you can even work on it. So, um, and that is sort of identified in backlog grooming. So that can be um, a meeting every, every week. That is the product owner and the team looking at the top priority items in the backlog and sort of making sure that they're fixed up and ready for the next sprint. And I have to say that that is something that our teams have not really done a lot of thought on, the, the backlog grooming part of things. But how we need to deepen our practice in that in that area. So that grooming would happen before um, enters the sprint, and then I That's guess right. you'd That's have right. enough information to provide a reasonably realistic estimate from that. That's right. And so, and the idea being the the, the goal of the product backlog grooming um, meeting or whatever is to make sure that you had enough enough stories or enough items for the next sprint. So that, um, you know, the rhythm you want with your team is, um, some do, a lot of people do it sort of, you know, you start on a Monday and then you end on a Friday two weeks later. Um, people have also experimented with starting on like a Wednesday and um, ending on a Tuesday two weeks later. Um, but then the idea is that then that next day, that Monday after or that Wednesday after, uh, you're you're starting with a sprint planning meeting again. You're you're like grabbing the stories, doing the planning, getting to work, and so that you just have this regular cadence of, you know, every two weeks kicking out shippable product. And it's um this working in this way puts a lot of um. The product owner is a very important um, role, and it is a busy role. And um, as we are working with our clients, our client, the person on the client side is our product owner. And so we're, we're doing a lot of training of that person and a lot of helping them understand kind of how much work it is <laughs> and how to do it well. Um, yeah, so um, it, in Scrum, it's also described as the single ringable neck. <laughs> so basically, that product owner can have the team work on whatever they want. It's their job to make sure that it is the good, it is the important stuff, the most important thing for the organization. So the team is, you know, focused on what's going to bring the most value. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any questions? I 
have a question, Sadie. Uh, mm -hmm. How long did it take to train the, the developer staff and the whoever the scrum master is when, when you're starting with a new team? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we um, our um, all of our scrum masters are certified scrum masters, which means that you've gone through it's like two days of training. It's not actually that um, onerous. Um, and then for our developers, as they come to work for us, I I give them a little training like this. Um, and then we really learn by doing. Um, and I, I would think that the most, I think that the most important piece of this framework is the retrospective. So that's the meeting where you stop and say, okay, how did things go? Um, and, you know, what went well, what didn't go so well, and what do we want to do differently next time? Um, and that's where the that's where the learning comes as a team. It's where the learning comes as individuals. Um, and it's the goal there is to have it be a really really safe space, so that it is not you know we're going to beat you up because you didn't do you know because you made these mistakes. It, it's not about that. It is about like let's really stop and reflect and learn. And that's the you know the courage to learn, the openness. To hearing feedback, um, and that's you know, I, I like I said, I think that is the most important part of the whole process. And um, I think of Scrum, it's it's a little bit like a yoga practice or a um, or med or meditation practice. I think it's like sort of like it's like a set of things that you do. You don't really understand why you're doing them to begin with, but if you do them regularly with that openness to what happens, you get to these aha moments. Um, you, like I said, you start to realize, oh, wait, we're not getting our items done. Ah, they're too big. And you, you know, learn to cut them down. Or, ah, I'm taking on five things at once instead of doing one thing at a time. But I, I would recommend that you have um, the, I guess another really important role is the Agile coach slash scrub master. It's like that person has to be um, sort of, um, uh, they, have to, they have to really own the practices and sort of keep the team focused on those practices. Cool. Well, we have time for a couple more questions, I think, if anyone has any. Software development for Scrum is just definitely not recommended. What was it? I didn't hear the first part. What was that? Is there, is there any software development where, where people know that Scrum just doesn't work? Or is it good for <laughs> anything? Um, I have to say I'm probably not, uh, I, I have drunk the Kool-Aid. <laughs> we, we use Scrum um, practice. So I, as I mentioned, I'm the operations person at Civic Actions, and we use Scrum practices in everything. Um, I, people struggle with it, with DevOps, and sort of like, um, you know, that high priority fix needs to come through. Um, so what do you do with the team? And um, so people have, you know, like I mentioned, the, the couple of things that people have tried. Um, but it does seem like even in my, um, you know, as I'm at, at Agile conferences or Agile meetups and things like that, it does seem like Scrum seems to be the place where people start. Um, and then through their practice and their retrospectives, they identify ways that it doesn't work for their environment and they, you know, adapt it or try things from different practices. Um, one, actually, one criticism, I was just at a conference last week, and one criticism of Scrum is that it, um, it does not have the software craftsmanship practices built into it. 
um, and and that that's that that's a weakness. You know, things like pair programming or code reviews, uh, things like test driven development. It doesn't specify those things, so the team can decide to do them or not. And um, you know, the criticism then is most teams decide not to do them because <laughs> they're hard. You know. But again, you know, and it may, and I think that brings back the the role of the scrum master or agile coach, where um, that person, I would like to see that person pushing their team to to you know test driven development, reviewing each other's code, um, you know, automating their testing, things like that. Great. Um, I guess another question I have is, um, I think Civic Actions has um, people in all over the world, right? Yes. Or mm -hmm. different time zones. So mm -hmm. do you have... We're mostly in the United States. Handle... Right Sir? Do we... We're mostly in the United States, but yeah, we do have one guy in Europe. Oh, okay. So do you... How do you handle kind of um, stand-ups? Mm-hmm. From people in different time zones, right? So that's another. Um, uh, so most people in the agile community would say that your team should be co-located. Um, right. Uh, you know, it aids in aids in collaboration and sort of you can easily lean over to each other and ask each other questions and things like that. Um, we are not co-located. We're we're all distributed. Um, we do stand ups on Google Hangout. Um, or you know, if you're if you're on the move, calling you know, we we will call people in. Um, we do our sprint planning also on Google Hangout. Um, although we might sometimes we um, do part of the sprint planning, sort of like the upfront stuff, identify a bunch of questions that need to be answered before we can complete it, and then you know, people go away and do their research and answer their questions or whatever, and then then we'll reconvene. To complete, to sort of commit together to um, to the sprint. Um, we also believe strongly in the you know um, on-site kickoff. So for early early work with a client, we will all come flying together and work together. Um, that's but and you know that's of course especially useful with building rapport with our client. Like I said, a lot of times they are not part of our organization. They are part of our client. Um, and we are doing a lot of teaching in terms of this is what it is to be a product owner. So um, on-site beginnings are, are good for that. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I'll put a final call out for questions if we have about five minutes left. Okay, it sounds like um, there's nothing more. So um, thanks, Sadie. This was a really great um, presentation and discussion afterwards. Great. Um, Please, and anyone feel free to get in touch if you do have questions or if questions come up later. I'm Sadie, S-A-D-I-E, at civicactions.com. Awesome, thanks. Um, right. So, yeah, I'd just like to thank also uh, Bruce and Bruce Caron and, and Adam Shepard for their help uh, preparing this. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you all for coming along. Um, I'll post up the the survey details um, on the list after the call, and uh, in a few, um, in a week or so, two, we should have the video up on, on YouTube as well. So, thanks again for everyone, and um, see you uh, at the next call. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.